So hello, Dr. Davis. Thank you for being here in this series of conversations about MFT, CFT, all these different topics. Yeah, thank you for having me. Glad to be here. <laughs> Um, thank you. So I know that uh, most of people, all of the people, they know you, but could you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your professional background? Sure. Uh, Dr. Sean Davis. I am a distinguished professor at Alliant International University in Sacramento in their uh, couple and family therapy program. Um, I've been there most of my career. Uh, I did a postdoc at the University of Kentucky uh, for two years where I was a faculty, but uh, otherwise I've been at Alliant for about 15 years Um so I have a also a private practice on the side, um, which is that's I'm in my private practice office now. Um, I own a large group practice, the Davis Group Counseling and Wellness Services, and mm -hmm. we have offices throughout California. Um, yeah. I also love to do writing, so a lot of writing on theory and and common factors. So that's awesome. So I know that besides your private practice, you also have some sort of classes for uh, MFT professionals, right? I do, yeah. I, my group is a CEU provider in California, and so there's a lot of uh, different um, classes that we offer through that. Um, we do a writing retreat. My my favorite thing these days is uh, we will do a uh, we have an indigenous healing retreat where we take people down to Mexico and to experientially learn about. Um, if there are cultures that don't value therapy as a means of healing, um, what do, how do they, you know, navigate challenges? What rituals do they rely on? What um, healing uh, practices do they observe? And so we have a little village down there and uh, that we go visit and a shaman walks us through things. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. That sounds very interesting and unique. I should sign up for that. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you know. We're going again uh, in a few months. <laughs> Great. Thank yeah. you. So I think that everyone knows that you are one of the experts in common factors. So for the start, could you please tell us more about common factors uh, for people who may not know about it? What is it? Is it a theory? Is it a framework? Is it an approach? What is it? Sure. Common factors is more a way of thinking about how change happens in therapy. Um, we, the field just sort of unquestioningly dove down headfirst down this path of assuming that it was the theory that led to change in therapy. And co what Common Factors does is, it's, is it pulls us back from that a bit and says, hold on, that's, let's not assume that that is the main thing that's going on with, with the a therapist and a family as they're sitting in the room. Um, maybe it's one of the things, but maybe there are a lot of other things going on as well. What And so common factors is fundamentally is occupied with this question of what makes therapy work? What is it about therapy that, that makes it healing? You know, mm -hmm. families interact with all sorts of people. What is it about that moment in therapy that is uniquely healing? Mm -hmm. um, and would you call that an approach or like framework? Uh, it's more of a maybe a paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, it's a way of thinking about theory. It's, it often gets mistaken as a new theory. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it's a way of thinking about theory and mm -hmm. how is theory relevant um, and all of the other aspects of, of healing as well, theory mm -hmm. just being one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's more of a um uh, a reorienting a paradigm that reorients the field um to think about change and healing more broadly mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense so given what you just mentioned how do you conceptualize the relationship or the therapeutic relationship in therapy well it's one of the most important pieces of therapy um mm -hmm both my own belief and experience, but also in the research, that's, that's the one that has kind of the most robust support. Um, I think of it as most people, um, a lot of the sufferings, and this is not including, say, like more biologically based type of um, sufferings that someone might be going through, but most um, mental illness, I think, has to do with 
uh, earlier wounds or kind of inadequate caregiving, people not really showing up for the person as they should have at, at critical developmental kind of phases of life. Um, and so, and then we develop uh, kind of ways of coping with that that don't really work later on in life. And so mm -hmm. if the initial rupture and the initial mental illness, so to speak, was introduced in the rupture of a relationship, then the healing occurs in the uh, the forming of a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and so that I think is one of the main things that therapy offers a client is this ability to, to, to form a relationship that is healing. And mm -hmm. in that relationship itself, those old wounds become smoothed over, healed, mm -hmm. filled in, so to speak, those mm -hmm. old bumps on their soul. <laughs> Yeah. Um, become filled in a bit and um, and the therapists that are better at forming deep sincere meaningful relationships with their clients caring loving um, all of that are the ones that regardless of what else they're doing I think mm -hmm. in therapy are the ones that offer the most profound healing mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. So it seems like everything is about connection, right? And so in our relationships, we suffer. And also in those relationships or other relationships, we can heal. Um, that's yes. part of, you know, what I got from what you said. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Much more succinct way of saying it. But yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. So, so because um, I'm thinking about these days, we talk about social justice, you know, diversity, inclusion, all these different mm -hmm. concepts a lot. And um, our training today about diversity and social justice is very different from, for example, 50 years ago, right? Um, so how do you see, what is the role of diversity or, so, or social justice and inclusion in common factors and in that therapeutic relationship when we are talking about them? Yeah, so if we could go back just to the example I was talking about with the therapeutic relationship, mm -hmm. you, if, if I approach somebody with this mindset of, I, I need to teach you how to live or I need to sort of... Uh, I need to basically make you more like me in some way, mm -hmm. like to give you my ways of thinking or my ways of going through the world. That isn't, it's inherently problematic, of course. And it, it's just a re-traumatizing of, of that initial um, mm. kind of relationship rupture. And so where does diversity factor into that? I think it, it starts with this acknowledgement that, if I am to be able to help you, I have to understand how you see the world as much as I possibly can. Not And not just how you see the world, but how you experience the world, how you go through it, how it, what it feels like to be you. Um, you know, maybe your skin color is different than most of the people around you. Um, maybe your sort of cultural practices are different than everyone around you, your religious beliefs, like, like whatever it is. Um, and I believe that I can't really begin to help someone at a deeper level until I understand and to a degree can feel what it feels like to be them. I'll never be able to be perfectly, of course, because, and maybe not even in the ballpark because, um, you know, coming from a different race, mm -hmm. culture, et cetera, gender. Um, but my point in all that is saying, if we are going to really connect with someone, we have to, in a way, deep enough to really help them heal, we have to see the world through their eyes as much as possible, that deep empathy. And once we have that, we naturally, I think, become invested in using whatever power we have mm -hmm. to make the world better for our clients who may have less less power than us and on whatever domain. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you can't do um, good, deep, meaningful work without a, without a appreciation and a reverence and a respect for other people's cultures and a commitment to understanding them and 
and also honestly a commitment to living your life in such a way that that makes theirs as um easy as possible gives them as much access to power as possible mm -hmm. um, to resources etc yeah exactly so that kind of reminds me of that like expert position that sometimes you feel like you are the expert of their lives versus like yeah. you feel like you are the expert of the process right and that lifelong right. journey of cultural humility so speaking of that do you feel like because we're talking about this expert position is there any conflict with having modern or postmodern kind of like approaches because postmodern approaches they are very flexible and they go along with this like non-expert position versus you know modern approaches what do you think about that you know i could go on about this for a long time so i will try to be succinct um i i would maybe take issue a little bit with this the common uh, the assumption that an approach it's in and of itself is um, open and uh, whereas another one is closed or, or whatever. I don't, I think it's not the approach, the theory that is open or closed. It is the therapist that is open or closed. And wow. I have known a lot of postmodern therapists, for example, um, who are, extraordinarily rigid in terms of the way they view the world mm. um, and and in terms of very subtly um, you know you need to see things the way that I do um, and is that a failing of their approach no I don't think so mm. I think that is a misapplication of their approach and in which their approach is not has not become their way of being you know mm. their way of being is still fundamentally sort of um i want you to be like me mm -hmm. and they are using that approach to to reflect that contrast that with um some of the most um nuanced respectful um following the client's lead therapy that i have ever seen has mm -hmm. been uh some strategic therapy that someone i know who's very very good at it uh, mm -hmm. does and strategic of course is usually on the complete opposite end in people's minds mm -hmm. at least in terms of respectfulness but they were helping me realize look in order to do this work effectively you have to see the world through their their eyes you have to mm -hmm. use their logic to intervene you have to use their words their beliefs their their culture um you can't do it any other way so a long way of saying <laughs> um I don't, I don't buy into this, this, what to me is a simple notion that postmodern approaches are respectful, Mo old modernist approaches are not, or they're, they're too, you know, patriarchal or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it's the therapist that is, mm -hmm. and, and the way that the therapist applies those ideas um, uh, will determine whether the client's experience of those ideas. Yeah. So I think what you just mentioned is so deep that I suggest people who are watching this on YouTube, like pause and, you know, go back and <laughs> listen to it again, because it was really deep. And if I uh, use your words correctly, you mentioned that the theory that we use is not, it's not about them being open or closed. It's about the therapist who is, you know, um, open or closed. And I'm going to use what you just said and uh, maybe like uh, reward it in other ways, because there are some people out there that they're very loyal theories right mm -hmm. um and i what i usually tell my students is that it's okay if you want to be loyal to a theory but like you can modify a theory right and yes. that modification is based on again like our training our diversity inclusion training today versus like 30 years ago or you know 60 years mm -hmm. ago or you know whatever and that is okay that doesn't mean like you're not doing uh, the theory. I I say like uh, theories are similar to recipes and when you're making mm -hmm. something you want to make sure that you're using the same recipe but you can always change the flavor and do it you know with your yes. own way of kind of like being yes. or your own taste if that makes sense. Yes agreed yeah if I could one last little thought on that or a different way of saying what I was saying is if you look the more 
loyal and dogmatic to one particular theory a therapist becomes, almost always, not always, but almost always, um, the more that therapist begins to embody what that model describes as dysfunction without exception. So look at, let's say, narrative, for example. Mm -hmm. If someone really, really loves narrative, which is all about inclusivity and valuing multiple stories and all mm -hmm. of this, um, ironically, the more that person becomes locked into the narrative way of viewing things as the only truth, the only right one, the only right way, and the more closed off they become, again, ironically, to other other stories, <laughs> which mm. is which is what they describe as a problem. Or if, let's say, you go to EFT, the more someone is really, really dogmatic about EFT, um, the more insecurely attached they become to that model, the more, mm. like, if you critique it or offer up something, they tend to get very defensive about, no, mm. no, that's not it, or, and they rally, circle the wagons, and, and, and their reaction to it is a very insecure, attached type of a, a reaction, rather than just saying, oh, yeah, you know, fair enough. this secure approach of like, oh, yeah, fair enough, maybe that's true, or, um, or off having a mature dialogue back and forth about it. So mm -hmm. you can say that with any differentiation. You, the more dogmatic a person becomes about their approach, the more they look like what that approach says you should not be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's very interesting. In my, Thank you. In my experience. So what's the point of that? Um, the point of that is to say that, again, it's not the theory. It's it's who you are as a person. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I often have this conversation with my students that I tell them, um, so all these theories and, you know, techniques and approaches that you learn, of course, they are important, right? But at the end of the day, maybe the greatest tool that you have is who you are. Mm -hmm. And that seems easy, but it's not easy at all at the same time, right? Because it needs this constant work on yourself. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? A hundred percent. It's a lifelong journey. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if, if my heart is such, and if my approach to the world is such of, of humility, um, then I'm much more likely to sort of, my work is, will be much more potent regardless of which theory that I'm using and, and is much more likely to reflect ultimately the ideals of that theory to begin with. Um, mm -hmm. But your clients aren't going to be clued into any of that. They're just going to be clued into how they feel when they're with you, how mm -hmm. they feel about themselves um, uh, and all of that. And, and that's a big reflection of how you view them, how you feel about them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, exactly. Um, so one of the questions that I ask my students is that, what do you want, how do you want people, your clients, uh, feel about themselves and experience themselves in your presence? right? That's, I think Absolutely. that's a good question. And then whatever your response is, do you have that within yourself? Is it something that you practice on a daily basis, weekly basis, you know, whatever? Um, what do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, that's a wonderful way of saying it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Helping um, that a therapist's character, I think, and, mm -hmm. and our, our character in terms of our, our commitment to um, treating each other as people and, and this sort of deeper conducting ourselves in a way that reflects that reverence mm -hmm. um, is, is foundational to our work as a therapist. It's not mm -hmm. the type of thing you can turn off on or off. Mm -hmm. It's the type of thing you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So speaking of that, I know that in your lectures and in your work, sometimes you talk about way of beings. Uh, and I know that so far you have talked about that um, a little bit. Is there anything else that you want to add about way of beings as a therapist? Uh, yeah, I have written a lot about that. And, and of late, those are the things I'm most excited about that I have written. Um, just because I think there's so much truth in, in that, um, this idea of who you are as who you are, um, not personality wise or anything like that, but who you are in terms of 
how much do I view the person in front of me as um, a human whose every whose whose needs and beliefs and values and and hopes and desires and dreams and wishes and all of that are every bit as real to them as mine are to me, um, and that based on the interaction that we have, even if it's brief, even if it's the checkout person at the grocery store. Mm-hmm. Um, the interaction will reflect either a reverence of that or or a disregard from that for that, and and that will ripple through through that person's day perhaps. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, I don't know anyone that can stay in that place all the time. I I am perpetually trying to hang on to it or or even get it to begin with. Um, but to hold it as an aspirational goal, I think is key Mm -hmm. to our work as therapists. Yeah, of course. So what do you suggest? How can people, MFT students, um, therapists, how can they work on that? So there are, um, there's a number of books that talk about this. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a number of articles, of course, that talk Mm -hmm. about this, um, the strong relationality is a concept they can look up. Um, way of being is a concept they can look up. There's a book called um, Leadership and Self-Deception mm-hmm. that I always uh, uh, have my students read. And then we will do a project where their whole goal is to go through a week and try to treat everyone that they see as people rather than objects. Yeah. And at the beginning, everyone is all always says, Oh, this is easy. I'm I'm a therapist. I'm super, you know, kind and loving and all of that. And um, they soon realize that it, there's way more to it mm-hmm. <laughs> than that. So, uh, just trying to be mindful of it. Um, it's like any new muscle you're trying to develop is just constant repetition of exercising it mm-hmm. and and realizing how am I viewing this person right now? Mm -hmm. Um, I like to watch for cues in me that I am off. um, And that tends to be like, if I'm really busy or if I find that people that, that I'm really annoyed with people, or if I'm assuming the worst about their intentions, um, all of those things are clues to me that I probably have drifted off my, my, um, my soul's routine mm-hmm. <laughs> of trying to of trying to nurture this way yeah. of being very helpful so um i think um so it's aligned with sometimes when i teach diversity class i tell students that diversity and both systemic perspective they're both like perspectives they're like this window that you look at the world through that window right they're not approaches that you say you know it's on or off right Right. and sometimes there's this um controversial debate in our field that you can be a great therapist an outside therapy room and I just go with extreme. You can be a horrible person. You can be a bully, you know, whatever. And uh, yeah. some people, they say that is possible. I personally say that that is not possible. What do you think about that? I think I already heard the answer, but like, I wanted to ask. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that that's true. I will say though, um, or I would disagree with that. I will say though, that I know of instances um, mm-hmm. where someone paradoxically through being a jerk inspired someone else to change (laughs) 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 like um you know through being mean or insensitive or or whatever it it prompted that other person to um you know whatever get in shape snap out of their rut whatever it was that they were trying they were working on i know of a few instances of that so we're we as humans are creative and we find inspiration Mm. in a lot of different places even if it is from saying i really want to prove that guy wrong (laughs) (laughs) or uh, i do not want to be like that um however as a those are flukes i think Mm -hmm. um and as a an overall approach absolutely i think um the more we embody the values that we're trying to espouse, mm-hmm. uh, the better. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm a huge fan of the process of thinking and rethinking. So I'm going to rethink about what you just said and <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know what I, what I feel about it. But thank yeah. you for sharing that. Um, so yeah. I know that you have, speaking of all these different things, you have this practice or exercise that you share with your students about going to the nature. And I think that it's very helpful for all of us. Could you please talk about that? Yeah, I, I grew up around a lot of nature and it's always been very much in my bones. Um, and I have been thinking about healing as part of common factors, healing more broadly than outside of therapy and like, okay, outside of this room, the therapy room, where do we, how do we heal? Um, and where do I personally find the most healing? Um, and inevitably it's nature. So I've been doing kind of a, a deep dive into that lately. And uh, last year I wrote, a, well, a few years ago, I wrote an article about nature um, and published it in JMFT with a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Tracy Bozlafi. Um, but then I thought I'm gonna bring this into the classroom. And so last year during the pandemic, when everyone was kind of isolated anyway, um, I said, in theories, we are going to, what I want you to do is, um, they read some stuff about nature and then we, I want you to go take, it was a long time, I think it was like two hours, take two hours, find some nature near where you live. And I want you to just sit and be in its presence and see what you learn about life from it. Don't distract yourself, don't take your phone, just go out and be in nature and see what nature has to teach you about relationships, about life, about love, about our responsibilities to each other. Um, and I thought, you know, they were all on Zoom in their houses. Some of them I knew were in the middle of, of urban um, you know, Oakland, one guy was in Oakland there, you know, I, I'm like, I don't know how much nature they'll find. I had no clue what was going to happen. Um, I thought this could be a huge disaster. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> everyone came back and it was one of the most profound classes I've, I've ever mm. been privileged to be a part of, um, as people shared all of the different things that they had learned just from you know, laying on the lawn and watching clouds or, or whatever, you know, sitting and staring at a tree. Um, it was fascinating. They all said it felt like, you know, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm a really big believer in expanding our thinking about healing beyond just this sort of narrow view of, of therapy even. Um, and looking at what brings healing in general. That's why I do these indigenous healing mm -hmm. trips. What are other cultures doing? Um, what can we learn? Because that's what we're about. We're about helping people heal, right? We're, we're yeah. not about advocating for this or that way of doing things. Yeah, exactly. That is so interesting. And uh, I told you, I borrowed your exercise and I did it in my class and I did it myself. And it was re yeah. really powerful. Like um, myself, like when I went to the nature, I've noticed like, it's so interesting that you see all these different things and sceneries in the nature, right? Yeah. But you don't want to control them, right? You see that yeah. this part has grass and this part water this part is frozen this part is whatever tree yes. and you see them as a whole as a meaningful whole right mm -hmm. and you accept it you appreciate it you feel like this is this is harmony this is beautiful but in our yes. lives it's not like that we mm -hmm. have a specific definition of harmony and, and if things they don't go together like there are contradictory on surface we feel like um, it's not okay. Like I should change that. So again, like many yes. more things, but uh, it was, it was a really powerful exercise and I appreciate you and I encourage everyone yeah. to practice that not only once, yeah. like often. <laughs> yes. Often there, there's a really quickly, there, there's a ritual in, or there's a rhythm rather to nature that, that works and is, is natural and is in us too. But we, we so quickly get out of that rhythm just with our busy lives and all mm -hmm. of this kind of fake stuff that we surround ourselves with. Mm -hmm. um, 
but, but when we set some of that down and just go out and try to listen and, and think of ourselves as out of sync and okay, what, what is the rhythm I need to find here and where is it? And yeah. it will come to you if you think about that. You, yeah. It might take a while, but it will come. Yeah. I always say nature is the cure. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great. So I know that you've been in this field for a long time and have contributed a lot to CMFT field and have we all appreciate and respect you for Thank that. You. So can you give us some examples of your takeaways from using common factors, maybe anything that, I don't know, surprised you or challenged you uh, time to time? Sure. First of all, it's weird to think of myself as having been in the field for a long time because <laughs> I still think of uh, that's not the case at all. Um, but maybe that's a segue into my story I, I, that I have um, that maybe first introduced me to com or got me thinking about common factors in the way that I currently do. Mm -hmm. And I was a, a trainee uh, in my master's program mm -hmm. and had supervision with one of our therapists who was a one of the professors who is known for being a, a particularly good therapist, like mm -hmm. the type of person you just sort of, if you sat by them, you kind of, you felt good. Mm -hmm. um, one, someone who just sort of radiated mm -hmm. um, healing. And uh, I went to, I was feeling really good. Things were going well. I went to individual supervision with her one day, got there, sat down and uh, she finished up an email and then turned and looked at me and she's like, how are you doing, Sean? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm fine. And she, she just sat back and she looked at me for a while and, and she leaned forward and she said, Sean, how are you doing? Uh, and I even retelling it, some of the emotion comes back. Like I just burst into tears um, and all this stuff that I had been feeling kept pouring out. Uh, just came pouring out. Um, I did. I wasn't even aware that I had been feeling it. Mm -hmm. um, and afterwards, I felt fantastic, just really unburdened and lighter. And mm -hmm. I was like, "Wow!" I said, "Leslie, how did you do that?" And she's like, I, "What do you mean? How did I do what?" And I'm like, "Ugh, no! <laughs> don't do the therapist like <laughs> dodging question thing like that." I didn't even know I things were off, but clearly you did. And just with one question, now I'm feeling so much better. And she kept saying, oh, I don't know, I, you know, she, you know, dodging my question. So all semester, I would bug her. I would say, Leslie, what did you do? How do you do that? What's the trick? You know, I need some of that sauce, you know, magic sauce. And uh, she, at the end of the semester, I said, look, Leslie, I've got a year and a half left in this program. I'm not going anywhere. You've got to give me something. And she said, okay, Sean, fine. Um, the problem is you are asking the wrong question. She said, you, you're asking, what, are, what do I do? She said, therapeutic isn't something that you do. It's something that you are. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, wow. mm -hmm. you know. Of course, in my mind, she ascends up into heaven, and you know, <laughs> but, uh, no, this. It, but for me, it was one of those really wise, pivotal moments in my in my development mm -hmm. and my career is realizing, because I've been so focused on mastering the skills, um, mm -hmm. and I do think the skills are important. Mm -hmm. um, I use them every day, um, but what I needed to really be not losing sight of at least and ideally developing was who I was as a person, mm. you know? It's one of those moments that I want to pause and just think about what you just said, because it's just so um, powerful and meaningful. And I think that it's, it's, it's helpful for all of us as therapists, because Again, as you mentioned, a lot of times we think that it's all about the theory and the technique. I Even like in supervisions, when I talk with um, my supervisors, I, I ask them, you know, the session really went well. What do you think? Why is that? And then they say, because I use XYZ technique. And then we have this whole conversation that that is just one yeah. part of one factor in all of this. There are all these other factors that are really important, who you are, the power dynamic, all these different things. Mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. So what is one thing that you would tell the younger version of yourself, maybe, uh, you know, when you were an MFT student about becoming a therapist? 
Uh, yeah, you know, my answer to that changes over the years. <laughs> um, it used to be, Sean, chill. <laughs> things are going to things are going to be fine. Things are going to work. Um, it's it things will work out more than you think. Now that now, I don't know that I would say much different. I might interject a few times in my journey where I was particularly down or particularly disillusioned or or particularly maybe off track and say, you know, keep trying. It's going to get better. This will make sense one day. Um, because in my struggle, in my journey, in grappling with stuff and trying to figure it out in a way that fit and made sense and felt congruent, um, it was the struggle that got me to the journey, you know? Mm. So I, I think telling myself things that would lead me to avoid that struggle may not have gotten me where I am, you know, mm. may have, may have sort of shortchanged my journey. Um, but that's never the answer anyone wants to hear. <laughs> so it, what I know now, maybe I'll say, what I, what do I know now that I didn't know then? Um, it's that this does end up working like this this does if you stick to the fundamentals you do end up becoming a therapeutic person you need to learn the stuff you need to do the work mm -hmm. um, you need to work on yourself um, but if you stick to those fundamentals mm -hmm. uh, it does end up working mm -hmm. very meaningful and very powerful I think it's I think it's Susan Cain who says uh, the pain that you cannot get rid of make it your creative offering. So I think sometimes mm. that's the case, not all the time, but sometimes that's the case for us as therapists. And yeah. um, it's interesting. And I tell myself, not the younger version of myself, but just today, I tell myself that just to <laughs> slow down and connect, right? Connect with others, yes. with the universe, with yourself. Especially in this Western um, culture, I think sometimes the pace is really fast, and whatever you achieve, you feel like there's this other other goal that is there and is waving at you, and you feel like I need to go and get that right, but mm -hmm. it, it never ends. So that process mm -hmm. of or that practice of slowing down and connect, and you know, as you mentioned, maybe like even like chill out, um, I think it is sometimes very very helpful, and you know, um, just trust yeah. the the journey that it will work out. Yes, agreed 100%. And that's a great quote. Um, I think that's a big part of why I like taking students down to Mexico and going there myself is that cult the culture there is is much slower, much more purposeful, much more relational. Um, mm -hmm. And it is like a, a drink of cold water for my soul. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. very, the Western culture, I think, is really has it backwards on so many things mm -hmm, mm -hmm, exactly so thank you so much dr davis for your time i know that um you know you are you have a busy schedule so thank you so much um i ask all the questions that i had is there anything else that you want to say at the end of our conversation no other i thank you for having me i appreciate it very much i always like uh talking about these things and to anyone who's listening um just keep going. It all ends up making sense. Just keep, stay humble, stay sincere, um, keep learning, and and it all falls into place. Yeah. And, and you really do, and I really do believe this, people have what will make them successful already in them. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's trusting that and believing that and and stepping out of the way of those things manifesting. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's so interesting because you talked about all these different things about common factors and the different things that you talked about. And I feel like your presence like, is, is like that. It's just when you're even like talking about these things, it's like healing. It's, 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 it feels really good and safe to, hear, to, to be here and um, listen to you. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I yeah, that. I echo what you just said that, you know, stay curious, stay humble, stay um, awkward. And uh, that journey, you know, it will, if you try, it will work out. Definitely. Thank you. Thank for you so me. much. Yeah. And thank you yeah. and have a great day. Bye. Yeah, yeah, you too.
拜。